But um, what I think in, in Barcelona, there's a brilliant work done by Andrea de Cristóbal, which are members of WeShare. And, and locally, they are developing the, the collaborative consumption uh, the movement in a very deep level, which I think is very important as a complementary issue with the collaborative production. No? But uh, as I said before, I think that um, not only Barcelona, but in major cities of, of the world, you can find at least a one maker space, one hacker space, at least, and or one fab lab. No? We are in the worldwide network of fab labs, we have 150 fab labs in 35 different countries, which means that people is not only interested on, on, on what is available in the market, but it's interested also in which are the tools that they can use to produce their own technology to solve their own, their own needs locally. Yeah. So I think that if the, the, in terms of, uh, of Barcelona, I think both private and public and movements are, are really going towards the creation of this kind of ecosystem, a productive ecosystem in a city that doesn't need it, which is very interesting because Barcelona is, it is, is a very powerful city in terms of production of spectacles, and events, and people go to Barcelona and get drunk, go to La Rambla, the big, uh, you know, sonar, primavera sound, everything is wonderful. But, but uh, even though the, within the city there is, a, there is this concern about, okay, what's next? No? What's, what's happened after? No? What, what, what is the touristic movement leading to Barcelona at the end? No? So, so it's a, we are willing to recover that, that power of creating knowledge within the city and to create like, closed loops of production the city walls, so I think that's more, yeah. And uh, uh, in terms of public services, uh, to what extent is, uh, is it collaborative in Barcelona? In terms of mobility or housing or? Well, th th this like the, um, maybe the most uh, know what the known one, the most known one is the uh, is, uh, BC in mm -hmm. Barcelona. It's one of the first cities that implemented like a big network of, of, of bike sharing. And, yeah. and I think that's uh, the most famous one. Or, or or the most successful one, no? and, and and then I think after the the, the visit, um, nothing really really important happened. Of course, Airbnb operates. It's a it's a it's a big that money doesn't because I, I even rent my my apartment for Airbnb. I'm here and now I'm, get, I'm earning more okay. while I'm here. So the thing is that being a touristic city, Airbnb is super successful. Not only B R D, but they are like a sub organizations that are not as famous or as global as Airbnb, but more local. So. I think the sharing of apartments and sharing of, of terms of mobility of bikes, uh, I think it's the most successful, successful one nowadays. So it's been really interesting for me to be living in Sydney and kind of observing this global movement and it's really given me a good, I guess, radar on exactly where the real growth hotspots are and also looking at Sydney and the way that it's um, adapted itself or learned from the examples of other, other cities around the world. So. Three years ago, it was a very um, light city in terms of collaborative consumption and sharing. We had the launch of a car sharing service called Go Get Car Share in 2004, and that's been hugely successful in the city of Sydney. But other than that, in terms of shared services, there have been very little, there's no bike sharing system in Sydney. But over the last three years, it's been really amazing to see the, the ecosystem of collaborative consumption entrepreneurs emerge, um, led by one of the, uh, the founders of one of the companies called OpenShare, Lisa Fox. And she's really worked with all of these uh, very early stage startup entrepreneurs to create this amazing collaborative environment where they're all learning from each other. They're all in a very similar stage in the growth of their business and they're being um, very open about the challenges and the opportunities that they're facing, as well as working in partnership with each other when they can, which I think is quite different from the more developed cities, whether it's London or San Francisco, um, where there's a lot more competition and the, the breadth of experience amongst the entrepreneurs is quite different. So you have some very successful companies at one end and then very early stage startups at the other end. But in terms of the city government itself, I think we've also seen um, a lot more interest in the last year or two as to how they can also uh, look at these approaches of collaborative consumption and make them part of what's called um, the Sydney 2030 vision. So the vision of uh, the Sydney City Council is green, global and connected. And uh, collaborative consumption and the sharing economy fits very neatly across those things. So we're seeing a lot of interest from, from them around that. And I think one of the particularly interesting things that the City of Sydney has done is they've realised that they have this um, amazing resource of spaces that have gone unused. Um, 
there's a main street called Oxford Street, which runs out of the city. And the city of Sydney actually has owned a lot of these buildings um, for, for many, many years, but has it's, it's a quite a strange area. It's a little bit um, run down, and there's not a lot of great commerce in that area. So about a year and a half ago, the city of Sydney actually um, made all of these businesses, sorry, made all these uh, facilities, all these office spaces available for creative people to actually apply to use those spaces at really, really low cost rent, something like $100 per week. And all of these amazing creative businesses, artists, um, small businesses, technology entrepreneurs have been able to take these spaces. Um, and the, the building that we're actually in, my fiance runs a co-working space in one of these buildings. And this space, which has actually got a view of the harbour, it's, it's slight, but it's there, um, but it was actually unused for almost three years before we actually moved in um, late last year, early last year, sorry. So that's been a pretty amazing uh, use of the city's resources and thinking about their spaces differently. Um, at the Collaborative Life, you, uh, you have an inventory of what's happening around the world. Uh, do you, can you talk, tell us maybe about two or three other cities which are to you exemplary, whether they're big or maybe smaller, because we always speak about big cities, but we have small, smaller cities maybe that are quite uh, active in terms of uh, collaborative, collaborative uh, ways of doing. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a directory of examples with more than a thousand different examples around the world from co-working to car sharing to peer-to-peer uh, -peer rental, a whole range of different examples of collaborative consumption. And I think there are obviously the, the major players include uh, cities like New York, London, San Francisco. But over the last two to three years, the emerging hotspots that we've noticed have really been places like South Korea. Uh, we've talked a little bit about um, what Seoul, the Municipal Council of Seoul has been doing to encourage a sharing city. And honestly, in the last two years, more than 30 uh, businesses have emerged in this space, which is a really rapid growth um, for a city that was really quite new to the concept of collaborative consumption. And uh, Brazil, as, as a country, has also been uh, quite excited by these ideas of collaborative consumption. And we've seen hotspots in Rio de Janeiro, in Sao Paulo, in Porto Alegre, and I think Porto Alegre particularly has really, it's, it's a big city obviously as Brazilian cities are, but it's quite a regional place compared to, it's not an epicenter uh, in terms of tourist activity and things like that. So they're really looking at this from much more of a public services and industry innovation perspective, which is I think quite an interesting uh, difference. Definitely. Um, Thomas, maybe, because you're in the satellite creation, so uh, do you see any obstacle and which obstacles do you see or do you foresee for the de development of the Sherwood City? Well, in, in, in our case, uh, it's a kind of tricky game. Um, the thing is that um, um, Pablo Barcelona is inside the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, which was founded by a group of people. These people that founded the Institute and, and, and the Pablo, uh, they are now running the city. So the deputy mayor of Barcelona in urbanism and ecology and uh, ITC um, uh, was one of the founders of YAG. And now the chief architect of the city was also one of, 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 of the founders of, of this institute and this idea of, of, of the Fab Lab in Barcelona. And uh, they got into the government two years ago um, with the idea of creating a, a new uh, urban model in Barcelona that is uh, mostly based on ITC and the implementation of new technologies in the city, in different levels, in infrastructure level, but also in these kind of facilities and services like Pablo like Labs. And, um, and, and, and also with the idea of with a very deep ecological and in, in humanist uh, view. You know? So the, the, say the mantra of Barcelona is many slow cities uh, into a smart city. You know? So it should, be, it should work like a, a, a small uh, neighborhoods which work in a, in a human scale, in human speed, and with you know, more, like, like more a PP, a person to person connection, and then with a, 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 enough infrastructure to have like a super high speed city connected to the rest of the world. The thing is that um, you know that Spain is, 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 is not doing good now, no? and, um, and they are closing uh, hospitals, and schools, and they are firing uh, educators and things like that. And, and of course, when you tell people that uh, in a city they are you know, buying, they are, they are spending a few technical few hundred thousand of, of euros in, in high-tech equipment to, you know, to train people in the use of new technologies, 
people don't understand it very clearly, you know? and, and, and of course it's, it's, it's the best spot for the, um, let's say, the other party to say you are you're spending money in, in things that make no sense. No? But the, the thing is that what we're really looking for is, is, is setting up platforms of the conditions of a new kind of services in the city in which people uh, can share the knowledge and, 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 and also can share um, not only the knowledge in terms of uh, non, non say, physical knowledge, but actually the ability of converting or, or turning that, that knowledge into atoms, into things. You know, and furthermore, create innovation within the city and, 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 and by citizens. No? So I think that, that mainly now we have uh, one of the main obstacles is, is, is the public administration and their fear of making one false step and then being uh, an easy target for the other parties to say you, you are failing. Because now it is very easy to do that in a, in a crisis moment in Spain. And then, on the other hand, we have uh, an, let's, let's say the, the heritage of of the last 15, 20 years of of a, of, a, of a country that has been constructing and building like crazy. They call it the construction bubble. And that's a phenomenon that happening in in Spain. And within those 15 to 20 years, people stop going to university to go to con as construction workers. And they were better paid than an uh, engineer or than an architect. So these people, that they, they didn't build knowledge. They just only accumulate goods. And now, I, I, sometimes I call the crisis of, of, of Spain, sometimes they cry, the crisis of the flat screens. You know, like, you know they, so it's not really like a deep, deep crisis. I'm coming from the South American country, I you know what a crisis is. But it's really a, a, more like a crisis of, uh, of values and, and trust. You know? so, and this, there are no values and trust, the sharing, Really, it's, it's, it's harder. No? So I think we are in that, in that kind of uh, you know, situation. And do you see ways people like you can help to solve the situation and get things better? Well, uh, I think that actually the the, the solution is not in the, in the government sense. It's in people like, like us. No? Uh, as I said before, I, co I co-founded this project called Smart Citizen in a, in a like kind of an individual scale, let's say, with a group of people. Um, in, in Barcelona, and we created an Arduino-based uh, sensor board, uh, low cost, that people can put in their balcony and start to capture data about the environmental conditions of the city. And then put that information into a platform and be able to share that information and to, share it, to start to compare data between neighborhoods and, and crossing that information with phenomena happening in the city and things like that. We did that project mainly because we thought it, at some point there was all this discussion about the smart city, you know, everywhere. IBM, Cisco, and the, the city councils were saying we, we have the key of what technology is going to change cities, and we're going to put a big amount of money infrastructure. We're going to buy very expensive sensors. We're going to sell it to the city, and you know your life will be better, and you will be only a consumer. So we say, why a smart city? Uh, a smart city cannot be produced or cannot be run by stupid people. It should, it should be produced by smart cities. So why we don't? develop these platforms for people to participate in the production of the city. And now the city council is trying to, uh, is, you know, they are, uh, next week I have a, a meeting with the city council because they want to buy the project and they want to implement it. It didn't come from them. It didn't come from a group of people interested in creating new tools and new platforms. So I think we're in a very interesting moment nowadays because us as peers or people, we have more access than ever to tools and online tools, uh, software tools, uh, hardware tools. Even if we don't know that, we have access to the tools to know how to use the tools to create services, apps, uh, pieces of hardware, intervene into the city, organize people, communities. And, and you know, we don't have, we don't have, we also don't, don't have any excuse of not doing it. No? So I think that, yeah, uh, I'm doing it <laughs> with a group of people, and, and I think ev everyone can do it. It's, it's quite easy. Lauren, you've got something to add concerning obstacles or? I think that the real obstacle that we're observing, um, my colleague and I, April, with Collaborative Lab, is really that people in, this, in the city government and the, the kind of powerful positions to really help these things scale, they're not really sure what first step they should take. They're not really sure what kind of role they should be playing. And I think uh, Thomas's example really is showing that perhaps there is very little role that they need to take, but they, they need to acknowledge that it's up to, to the citizens to sort of play the, their own role. But I think that that kind of um, tension is really evident in a number of cities around the world. Uh, I also think that people are looking to each other for an example to be set. 
So everybody's waiting for somebody else to make the first move rather than being um, the one who, who makes a move and gets something wrong. So I think that that's quite a, a funny thing, really. Uh, you know, in our conversations with different city governments around the world, everyone's sort of like, oh, but, you know, what's, what's Seoul doing? What's San Francisco doing? Uh, rather than looking at their own assets and their own unique situation. Because at the end of the day, every city is uh, very unique in terms of how it's governed and the responsibilities of, gov uh, of that level of government differs from, from city to city. <laughs> Hello. Of course we won't be. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> okay, we're going to leave Molly alone for a few moments. She ran to be there. Um, why might sharing be good for cities? I mean, we have, as you said, for Spain, but it works for any big city in the world today, we have employment problems, we have housing problems, we have, well, many problems linked to what's going on in the world. So in why should or why is sharing an answer or part of an answer concerning these problems that cities are facing? Well, um, let's say, in a theoretical point of view, it's like obvious. No? We have, for instance, um, I think there is, uh, it's almost like, you know, 25% uh, more house, uh, more houses for the amount of people that uh, you have in Spain. And the, most of the people have, a, you know, a house in the, in the beach or secondary housing and, and, and you know, and the things that we keep constructing, why? I mean, um, the things that we constructed in, in a way a system of a world of accumulation in which um, you don't need only a house to live, but you need a house to well, go to the beach, or a house to go skiing, or whatever. No? So we need to keep continuing products, producing, producing, producing. So one of the obvious, obvious you know, the results of sharing would be like we will stop of the massive construction of by you know just by nothing, no? or this kind of you know compulsory uh, uh, um, uh, let's say wheel of keeping the machine running and building and building and building, and building and without a reason. No? So I think that, yeah, theoretically, it will reduce, possibly it will reduce the effect uh, that we're having on the planet, okay? It will create more, a stronger social ties between people. Uh, but the things that uh, we believe and we created are individualistic and capitalistic uh, society. And, and we will still live with that for a while, I think, no? and, and, and the things that, again, the theory, the theory from the practice is, is still very unlinked. Find, you know, maybe the bike sharing is, is, a, is an example of you know a massive, uh, let's say, application of how you can share resources into the city. But when it touches something that is yours, it's different. You know, when when it's your bike, it's different because that bike is, is from the city, hall and I can share it. But what happens when, it, when it's my bike? There are a few examples in other cities that you can share your bike, or maybe your bike is not yours, but it's from a community. But but still, I think that sharing when 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 it, when it reaches to a to a personal level. Uh, or to an individual level, it, it, it's very related with, uh, with a mindset that we will still, we, we are still, you know, involved. No? So, you know, yeah, it could be the saving of the world, but <laughs> the practice we, we need to work here. Hello. Uh, just to add, I mean, I totally agree with everything Thomas said, but I think the, the interesting thing about cities is that they really are these kind of perfect platforms for sharing, and that's really where they've evolved from, where there's shared services and people can live in much more dense environments because they have access to all of these things. But somewhere along the line, we've started to bring this, um, you know, more suburban mindset into the cities. And we, we're wanting to have more space within the cities to, to satisfy all of our needs rather than tapping into shared services and, and looking for other ways to, to get access to the things we need without needing to own everything. And, uh, you know, people are also then moving out of the cities because they want bigger places, which is creating this more urban sprawl environment. So somehow we need to, to help people feel like they have, um, you know, space and independence, as well as being able to have more uh, than they would otherwise have if they were just relying on themselves. And that's, that's where cities really, um, you know, do come into their own because of the density of you know, the environment as well. Um, I don't think it's a question of whether sharing is good for cities. Sh uh, cities exist because of sharing. That's why we created cities, because it was more efficient and more productive to live together and to share resources and to specialize as cobblers and welders and whatever we were back 
when we created cities in the first place. Um, we've forgotten, as Laura mentioned, we've forgotten how to live in cities when we all decide to move to suburbs and buy our own washing machines and have our own backyards. So it's not a question of whether it's sharing is good for cities. Sharing is essential to cities. That's how they function. That's why they exist. So I think it's only natural that um, the sharing economy be pioneered in cities and be embraced by city governments, because essentially that's what city government is supposed to do, help citizens share resources more efficiently and more productively. Do you, do you think there are areas that should be solely managed by public authorities that has nothing to do with sharing economy? Yes, I do. Um, like I said last night, although many of you weren't there, um, a lot of us forget that our sharing solutions, while really positive, may only benefit a small portion of the community and may not benefit others. For example, if your sharing platform is based on technology, people who are internet illiterate, who don't have access to mobile, to smartphones or the internet, may not benefit from it. So the role of government is to make sure that all citizens are benefiting from whatever programs exist. But additionally, let's not forget that um, the private sector didn't build Central Park in New York. There are things called public commons and the public good that the city needs to look out for. And the private sector just simply cannot create those things and look out for those things in the long term. Airbnb may partner with the city, but if Airbnb goes out of business in two years, the city is totally screwed, for lack of a better word. So absolutely, the city needs to create their own sharing platforms and look out for all of their residents. Yeah, I think cities have this amazing opportunity to actually be distribution channels for some of these platforms. As Molly was saying, they, they have a voice or a direct connection to all of the residents of the city, whereas some of these new startups are either communicating to a particular crowd because of the, the nature of the startup, or perhaps they're really even looking for ways to build critical mass, uh, and they, they can't reach enough of the community that they need to reach in, a, in order to, to build sustainable service. So cities really can be looking for opportunities to support their public services where you know the, the actual task goes beyond their, their scope of responsibility, but they can actually help residents to see what other opportunities there are to you know tap into shared services that the city doesn't provide but endorses or supports in some way. I think that's really the biggest role that they can play in, in allowing these things to scale. Do you have examples of city governments that have done that quite well or that have been farther? Yeah, I think than um, others. There's experimentation in this space, and I think um, City of Sydney is really trying to do this as well. There's, um, we have a problem in, in Sydney, and I'm sure it's a fairly universal problem, of curbside rubbish dumping, where people are like, I don't want this couch anymore. It looks like it belongs on the corner. I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> and, and the streets are full, like even the nicest suburbs, like Bondi Beach, which everyone would expect to be beautiful and pristine. People are, you know, backpackers are moving out and they're leaving, you know, microwaves, TVs, all of these things on the streets. And while the rubbish collection is obviously a municipal task and there is a, a truck that goes around and in fact there's a service um, that people can register for larger objects to be picked up if they are only responsible enough. But unfortunately that's not always the case. So there's a, a technology platform called GOMI and what they're aiming to do is uh, enable people to kind of snap a picture of something that they see on the road give it a location and say, you know, uh, available iron board on the corner of this street and allowing that to be something that the citizens can just tap it. It's kind of like a free cycle uh, type platform where people can just go and pick up uh, these things that are being left and it's helping the city to, um, you know, give these places, give these things a home rather than just being left on the street and being dumped or trashed because nobody knows how to find them. So um, the city of Sydney is actively trying to support a platform like GOMI without making it part of the city of Sydney's services themselves. Well, no, I, I was thinking about that, that, that is totally true what you say, that the, the cities itself are, let's say, the essence of cities is, 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 is sharing. I totally agree, but in a way, the, the last hundred years are going, have been going in the, the opposite direction. No? I, I think that, um, again, we, we, we have got into a model in which uh, as the, the less you share, the, the better you live. <laughs> no, you know, the, at least until maybe the last five years. So now we're entering to a moment that, that probably uh, that we are kind of going back in a, in a kind of you know high tech middle age uh, kind of thing within, within cities. And, and, and in that sense, I think that the role of a, of a 
public authorities or governments is, is to set up commodities, uh, the, the main commodities infrastructure, water, uh, sewage, and parks, and etc. and then create or, or support platforms for, for people to, you know, to produce the city by themselves. If, if we cannot leave it to the hands of the government, the production of the city, the same in the, in the, in the more, the, the, in the visible layer, the same, the non visible layer, okay, we leave it to them, but the visible layer, the one that we live every day, the one that, that affects us every day, it should be, you know, produced by us. It sounds very abstract, but, but in practice, uh, I, I mean, things like, like you know, uh, Local production into cities, the sharing, the trash. The trash will be the new, the oil of the future, actually. And the, it, it might be that now we extracted more copper. The, there is more copper extracted from the earth than the that the, the amount of copper that is still on earth. So we will extract copper from from the trash. And so it could happen with plastics. It could, it could happen with metals. I mean, and, and in the future. So so we, we need to set again new new platforms or, or new uh, you know new ways of us as citizens uh, playing a role into the city, not only expect to be to, to the things to be delivered into our homes, so we, we have to get out of our houses again. And, and, and you know, more, a lot of people, you know, maybe predicted that uh, things like Facebook or Twitter will, or the internet will, will keep us at home and we will not go out to, to meet people. No, it's the opposite. No, this tool should be the, the ones that have some of the platforms to, you know, to promote the more optimized interaction between citizens uh, for better cities. Um, well, we've, indeed, we talk a lot, uh, a lot about cities, and we know that within a few years, 70% of the worldwide population will be living in, in uh, urban areas. But how is collaborative economy potentially impacting uh, rural areas? that we tend sometimes maybe to forget. Also because we have this, uh, maybe this gap in uh, equipment and uh, internet knowledge and so on. But how can it impact and how can it go towards this, uh, this world that is still uh, alive, existing, and important for uh, certain numbers of, uh, of, um, of areas? Lauren? I think there's a really interesting opportunity for rural areas. It's, it's not going to look like it does in the cities, that's for sure. And I think, uh, you know, rural areas are actually, again, very accustomed to this kind of community building and sharing activity. So it's not that the behaviours are foreign, but the, the density of the area makes it difficult for things to happen as quickly or as easily as, as possible. I think the other challenge facing rural areas is, um, you know, small businesses are heavily reliant on the custom of the, of the people in that area. So when you're starting to say to the hardware store owner, oh, sorry, we only need the one drill this year. Um, we're all going to borrow bills. Um, so come back next year. You know, that, that's, a, that's a responsibility that the community has to keep its small business alive. So there's a challenge on that end. But I think there's also, uh, when you look at the online op opportunity and the offline opportunity, this is a way to empower people in rural communities in ways that they currently don't have an opportunity to be empowered because a lot of these platforms are actually enabling people to do things virtually rather than being physically present. So when you look at the exodus of young people from rural areas to go and be in the cities, um, you know, platforms such as whether it's TaskRabbit or even some of the, you know, authentic experience platforms that could actually be bringing people to these small towns and giving them much more of a, a kind of reputation that they otherwise wouldn't be able to have. I think that's something that is new and, and available through the sharing economy to, to really solidify uh, the character of these rural areas and not make them feel like they're competing with, with the city's attention. To be honest, I'm not really that concerned with the rural areas, mostly because I'm an urbanist, I spend most of my time thinking about dense cities and I think we have plenty of problems there. But if I were to be concerned about how this model could impact the places outside of the dense urban areas, it would actually be in the suburbs. I think that's one of the greatest challenges of our time coming up, is we're seeing massive urban migration of people from the suburbs and rural areas into cities. That means that cities are becoming much, much more expensive. There's recent data in the last US census that wealthier individuals are moving back into cities again, um, whereas they used to live in suburbs. So who's going to be left in the suburbs? It's going to be lower income families left in the suburbs that are politically disenfranchised, economically disenfranchised, and I think one of the biggest problems they're going to face is with increasing urban density and the increasing importance of the urban core, 
suburban residents are going to be left with fewer and fewer public resources, such as transportation. How are those low-income individuals that cannot afford cars of their own going to get to their jobs? And again, jobs are also moving back into the city center. So I think the sharing economy um, holds great promise for the future of suburbanites, and um, I think that's uh, something, a huge challenge that it can help uh, solve. Do you, do, do you know any city government that is addressing that problem today, or is it still something that is not truly addressed by anyone? You know, it's not really a problem quite yet. It's a problem that's coming up. We're still seeing this massive migration. Um, I think the U.S. is really the first place, because the U.S. was one of the first countries to suburbanize so significantly, and now we're just starting to see in the last census data people moving back to cities. So suburb suburbs are still really well occupied, except for you know places in Las Vegas and Arizona where they built all these homes that were actually never occupied, and several of them are foreclosed. So there's a problem there, but that the problem there is people just simply don't live there anymore. I'm concerned about the people that are relegated to the suburbs because they can no longer afford to live in the cities. That hasn't happened quite yet. We'll see. Thomas? Well, 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 that's a, it, it depends on where you look at. And, um, and, and for instance, in Latin America cities, they're still going to orbit sprawl. It's amazing that today they're, they're still following like a model that, that is like 70 or, or 80 years old. But in, at the same time, another, if you look another, in another place, for instance in Spain, uh, people are going back to the, to the towns of their fathers or grandmothers and because the, the life is, is, is so much cheap, cheaper than that. As, uh, it's, 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 it's really cheaper than, than it seems, no? So I think that, that, that we, what is fascinating now uh, is that the, the whole world is not moving towards one direction, uh, let's say. It seems that now we, we start to have like, branches of, of different phenomena in, in, in terms of, of, of models of urbanization and, 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 the, and the city development, no? And um, what, is, what is really interesting is that how the different you know, for instance, if you go to Latin America, probably you won't see these suburbs. There, 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 there's no internet, no? There are, but there's really, really poor conditions of, of, of living. No? But but then if you go to the towns in Spain, they have fiber optics in, in, in there. No? So I think that there, you know, it, it's really like a very different approaches. But but I think, for instance, um, the, the sharing tools uh, in any case, in mostly the, the online sharing tools. In the terms of you know the local farmers, they, they will have direct contact with the final uh, you know the final clients, and, and they could create some kind of you know, alternative way of, of distributing the, the products. No? And, and, and and how we can think that happening not only not only with separating the rural and, and, and the urban area, but if we think as a, as a whole you know as a, as a whole thing civilization. In in today, I, I think it's the rural and the urban. Uh, I don't, I don't see the, the real difference because uh, you can have, have these kinds of residential communities typically lack that that sense of community, even though they've been created like that. They're very sterile places, and so that's one example of a, a sharing economy platform trying to reach that level of scale and with with the partnership of an organisation like that. I agree with you. I think absolutely the sharing economy should be partnering with the bigger businesses, but don't discount the importance of local government. Um, so Stockland was the name of the company. Stockland is not going to partner with sharing economy company just out of the goodness of their heart. They're going to do it because there is a reason, a financial reason to do it. The market is asking for it, whatever. Perhaps the local government is requiring them to. So the role that the local government plays isn't telling, you know, partnering with you on how to build a green building or a smart building. The role that the government can play is to either require developers to build those kinds of buildings or incentivize them to. So you can see this, you know, and it's not just local government. An organization like LEED, which is becoming very prevalent, and a lot of local governments are saying you need developer, you need to build a building that is the equivalent of LEED gold, whatever. Um, organizations like LEED can incorporate sharing standards into their criteria, just as a city can say, hey developer, you get a density bonus, you can build three more stories on your building if you do X, Y, Z. So they can help us incentivize these big players to incorporate more sharing models. Now, um, I have a very clear example, and let me go back uh, with, the, with this project, with the Smart Citizen project, and that's it's very interesting because 
uh, as I told you, we, like a bunch of people, gathered together and said, you know, we need to develop like a low-cost open source platform for people to capture data in their, in their houses and not expect to, you know, the government and IBM to spend a lot of money on it. And, and just recently, uh, Cisco, Cisco Systems, just found we, we are opening a new laboratory inside next to the public with Cisco, in which we're going to work together with Cisco in the city, in the city hall of Barcelona in the development of these citizen-based platforms for, for the, the city production. No? So the thing is that how I see that collaboration happening is by making, making things. And, and and one of the things I, I really regret is that they sometimes it end up having you know this kind of sticky note workshops. And then we have the guy with the tie, the guy who looks like a geek, and the other guy from the city hall, in which you know it's nonsense. And then they try to do something together, but they cannot. And and so the things, how this really happens, and how practically again, how the theory from the practice is totally linked, is, and it's really leaving each one to do their work in their environment, and then put them together when it gets the time. And that timing is the most important part of the thing. Because that time, you maybe you, you don't need the money of the government at some point in your project because it will just make you you know forget about the project and you will go traveling or uh, yeah you, then you that time is, is, is maybe the most important more than part most important part of, of, of this kind of collaboration that, that could happen but but again Cisco itself cannot make smarter cities uh, the city of, of wherever cannot make it uh, alone and the citizens themselves they, they cannot make it alone so. These three powers need to act, but with synchronicity. That's very difficult. One question. Yes, hello. My name is Ika. Um, I'm from Fearby. That's a website where you can borrow stuff from nearby. Um, I have the question oh, what can the government do, or what can we as a, a platform or website do to be more accessible for those groups in the suburbs? Um, are there any, do you have any examples? Uh, um, because there are also groups which are not even that good in using the internet, for example. And these are people which um, I think they need the access to these kind of uh, initiatives as well. So. It's a very difficult question. <laughs> but uh, no, so when, when you were talking, I was thinking that Maybe before the internet, the television and the radio were the most successful channels of communication between people. No? I think that we have we have had like very very important moments in time in the use of technologies to spread knowledge about you know new ways of life. No? And in the 15th century, it was Gutenberg with the print press that makes the, the knowledge to travel in a different speed and then furthermore changes the way we live. The, I think the TV and the radio in the beginning of the 20th century made that role, played that role uh, as, uh, again, but in a unidirectional level. It means that you have access to information, and whatever is in the TV is the truth, and someone is delivering to you the information. So now, maybe the most difficult part in the, in the, in the one that you are talking about is how the people not the only use the internet to navigate and to obtain information, but actually how they use the internet to produce information to make resources available to share with other people and so on. That's a matter of time, I think. <laughs> but but it, it's that, that we, we are, as I said before, we are still you know, carrying with a model in which we are sitting waiting for. And, 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 and we are moving towards that, that other model in which uh, we have the resources to make it happen. And, and it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of social initiatives in the Netherlands and they really want to be accessible for everyone, but yeah. that's not the case. Yeah, but, I'm sorry. No, no, but, but yeah, it's not only you being accessible for everyone, it's that everyone wanted to be with you. No, it's like you, know, you are in love with someone that someone doesn't or want to be <laughs> You know, I mean, okay, it's possible, but I mean, you really need to come, okay, it, it, it may be timing again. It's a time that you identify, which is that time in which th there are many technologies that have been invented like out of time, and then and a lot of things maybe we will see uh, we will see them in the future. They will be totally useful. But again, um, when is the time that those people that you think you need this money, but they need to feel that they need it in order to, to be with more? No? So uh, 
I was just going to add one quick yeah, response to that. Uh, I think no, that's the, um, the example that I mentioned of open shares is one strategy, but I think another area that is a really natural place for these platforms to be focused is things like school networks, where you have, you know, often people are learning about these technologies from their children, as well as giving a physical home to these platforms, a natural drop off point. You know, people are meeting anyway, so how can you work with school networks to actually introduce a platform that's specifically for that school and for the parents to then start learning. I think, you know, generationally it does trickle up sometimes, so I think that's a really great place to start. Whether it gets to the grandparents and the great-grandparents, maybe not, but I think it's, it's a really good start to, to change behaviours over time as well. Well, I'm sorry, we're running out of time, so we're going to stop here. If you have, well, any other questions or want to discuss anything, just do not hesitate to come and see one of our speakers, and thank you very much. Thank you.